Hi everyone, I've got 7.30. Welcome to week number three. Thank you, Katie. Week number three of the Survive PhD MOOC wrap-up live broadcast. It's becoming a bit routine for us here, and uh, which is a good thing when you've got technology, so welcome. Our numbers are increasing, which is fabulous. So there's about 12,000 people in the MOOC at the moment, and we learnt this week that we have the five millionth edX learner, whose name is Sarah Maggi, and she's joined us from Cairo. So welcome, Sarah, and welcome everyone who's new this week. We hope it didn't take you too much time to catch up. So the topic that we discussed this week was the imposter syndrome and confidence, and boy, did it really resonate with lots of people. The discussion boards were full as usual and really interesting. Some people discovered that perhaps they were suffering from the imposter syndrome, if we can actually call it a syndrome. Really, it's just an observation of a set of symptoms. They've discovered that they're suffering from something that has a name. And some people were glad to feel that they could label it, talk about it. Other people wondered whether it was a useful label or not, which is something we'll get to later in the broadcast. Uh, some people found out that actually they're not suffering from the imposter syndrome, which is fabulous. And so I think all we should all think, think of the future and think about us uh, supervising in the future. So if we don't suffer from imposter syndrome now, we might recognise it in a student later. Or if we do, we might recognise symptoms in others. So it's really great, I think, to, to talk about it and give it a name. So thanks for all the great discussions. Just a quick note on workload. Someone wrote to us and told us they'd spent 20 hours trying to catch up on the MOOC and we were all appalled by that because we aren't spending 20 hours, well I am but no one else is, um, in the MOOC each week. Oh Katie is, Katie's pointing at herself, Katie's definitely spending 20 hours in the MOOC. Um, but you, you don't have to, you participate as much or as little as you want. All we ask for is one discussion board post and to watch and fill in the checklist each week. So. 20 hours only for the super keen. And um, hey, if you're enjoying it, who am I to say no? Uh, the further readings that we include in each module are just for your interest only. So it's really just about what you find you want to extend your thoughts with, whether you want to look at the scholarly literature, whether you want to read some of the articles, that's really totally up to you. Thank you so much to those people who are reporting posts. We're noticing other people are struggling emotionally, feel like they need a bit of love from the moderators, we're more than happy to give the love. And that's been really helpful to us and I think highlighted some people who maybe just needed a bit of spot of specialist advice, some extra um, links and so on. Okay, my, my trusty moderators, Katie and Margaret, are sitting on the Twitter chat this evening, but actually we're going to have one of our moderators come and start doing the broadcast because I did promise mentorship when I asked them to do moderating. And so we're learning as we go and it'll be Anna's turn tonight. Okay, badges. We know that it's super exciting. And um, Oz Julian, who unfortunately can't join us tonight because he's traveling, he said um, on Twitter that maybe the badges seem a little bit silly, but when you get one, it feels really great. <laughs> um, and um, so if those people are gonna feel really great this week, we'd like to give the badges for the discussion forum to Lara Sanderson and Kims Brown in Dunedin. Great animation of the post-it note. We pinned it in the forum, so you can see it if you log into the forums. Um, and we just thought that was great, so creative. We're looking forward to the more kind of creative um, visual, perhaps drawings, whatever you want. So we've, the activities that we've got going down the track um, will give you some scope to be as creative as you like. We'd also like to send a badge to Bron Lee for connecting the discussion on the circles of support um, with the structures of the medieval university. We could feel the learning, Bron Lee, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for that. On Twitter, where do we even start? Twitter's just been so fantastic. Some, um, a person, I can't remember who, described it as one great big classroom of PhD students. People are showing pictures of their cats. Please, more cats, some dogs. I love the pictures of you eating food. I collect those, as you know. Um, so it's really fabulous to, to see the interaction going on, the Survive PhD 15 hashtag. Thanks for that. And so the two Twitter um, badges that we're sending this week is to Amy J. Writes Good, Writes Good and Natasha Barrett 18. Thanks, guys, um, for, for that's such a great contribution. Um, Julie, Oz Julian, as I mentioned before, is but one supervisor doing this course. Um, Daniel Kiten asked, why isn't the imposter syndrome taught to every research supervisor as part of supervisor training in every university in Australia? Well, maybe it will after this course. 
Um, you can use any of our materials, obviously, as Creative Commons, so please feel free to share um, outside of the MOOC. Okay, so as promised, I'm going to hand over to our great moderator, Anna, and she's going to go through the first set of questions from the MOOC about the imposter syndrome. I'll take it away, Anna. You ready? She's a bit nervous. Give us some love hearts. <laughs> love hearts. Thank you very much, Inga. And hi, everyone. Um, so let's start with Guto Santos, 82, who asked, is imposter syndrome a bit like a horoscope? Where hearing a list of symptoms makes you think you must be suffering from it. Yes, you probably need to be a bit careful before you apply a label to yourselves. As we noted in the course material, it is not a diagnosable condition like autism or anxiety. It's a set of reactions which, when grouped together, are common enough to get a label attached to them. But a label is awfully helpful when you, when you want to give a way to talk about something. For example, it allows us to easily explain things to others. A label might give you ideas for actions you can take. Beyond that, it is probably not that helpful. So, Chamwa asked, how do you tell when it's actually imposter syndrome? That is, what is the difference between it and, say, a self-critiquing reflection for improvement? Back from the Dead replied, for me, the difference is that feeling of being an imposter can be crippling to my ability to work, distinctly different to self-critique for improvement. It's hard to improve on this, as Inga said. A little, a little bit of imposter syndrome can be a good thing, as it keeps us sharp. It's when the self-critique type can become deliberate, deliberating, <laughs> debilitating, that's right. <clears throat> uh, that is exactly when we need to start to take action. But as David Jeffrey eloquently put it last night, embrace the imposter syndrome. The, the imposter feeling keeps you grounded. And I think I would be more concerned if I didn't feel like an imposter sometimes. Hmm. Drone64, just last night, also wrote, if you recognise that just learning one new thing each day is an achievement which complements your personal knowledge circle and increases your confidence, will you be more able to grab each opportunity that arises during your, during your research? So, if you go with the flow, you will enjoy life in the world of your PhDs and much more. So now from a mother who is doing her PhD, so being O oh, used the quote, behind every kid is a mother who is pretty sure she is screwing things up. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> for some of us mothers and fathers out there, an analogy might be used for the thesis. The thesis, like parenthood, is demanding, rigorous and draining at times. And well, after all of your efforts, you may still feel left dealing with an unruly child, or as in the case, the PhD thesis. So, Drosen64, going with the throw analogy, certainly fits both the PhD and parenthood. Aluka asked, what do you say to your students for helping them to regain confidence? Laura Graffin answered well when she said, I can't speak for everyone. But for me, it helps when my supervisor lets me know what is good about the work as well as the critique of my work. The second one is when the supervisor lets me know where there is something interesting in research, particularly if it has made them think differently about the subject. The third thing she said is when my supervisor lets me know that my feelings are normal, that my journey is normal, that struggling is normal. That I, have, that I have not done my PhD before and that I cannot be expected to have all the answers and everything I know. So, reassurance can work wonders. I also found it helpful when my supervisors share how they have struggled with research or are presently, presently struggling. It continuously helps me to recognise that, that all academics struggle. And no one is perfect, nor is any research journey perfect. I think when a supervisor shares their problems, it makes it much more open 
a much more open forum for you to do the same and to share yours, which is normally the first step forward when solving it. Inga said, I couldn't put it better myself. It, but I would add that a visit to your university's counselling centre can be an amazing and helpful thing. They are usually highly experienced at helping people to pick themselves up again. So now on to the anonymous poster who asked, as someone who feels they need to work hard to succeed, how hard do you actually need to work to complete a PhD? Can you manage it from nine to five and avoid working weekends? Mm. Nick Hopwood actually studied this and found that students who were struggling the most were also studying the most. It seemed in his sample at least that people who spend more than 40 hours working had diminishing returns. Working more hours did not make the result any better. You can chase up some of Nick's work on his blog, which my fellow moderators are treating right now. Juliana wrote in to say that she is constantly battling with thoughts that I cannot read well. Writing in academic language and in a second language is really tough and sometimes I feel paralysed, she said. It's a familiar feeling for many of us, I'm sure. We are going to deal with it more in, in our module on fear. So another anonymous post also said, all the literature I reviewed contradicted that my supervisor would, what my supervisor would tell me, and I had no idea what to do. Hmm. I felt really stupid for not being able to reconcile what my supervisor told me and what the literature told me, to the point where I had a breakdown and had to go to counselling sessions. How would one deal with this situation? I felt underqualified to, to question my supervisor. Again, there were some really great responses. Arawagi said, my situation was that I felt very much like you. I could not question what I was being told. However, as, a supervise, as the supervision went on, I realized that the beauty of supervision was that we could learn from each other. I think that a turning point in the supervision was that I sent him an email one day and said that I feel like I'm in, inter in an intellectual bubble. Do you know who I could talk to about my topic? Could I get in contact with an old lecturer from another university who I knew also had an interest that was vaguely connected to mine? But I noticed that by admitting how I was actually feeling, the supervisor gave me permission to talk to others and it began a relationship that was much, much more productive. Inga said in response to this, your situation speaks to the power relations that can be so problematic in supervision. If a supervisor is not willing to open themselves up to genuine intellectual engagement, as our Wag Waggy has described, it can be really difficult for a student. So, C. Tran Hong Bak said, they could relate to Sally LePage, feeling too young to be a PhD student. Vicky Whitman responded that it might have nothing to do with age. She says, although I'm a mature student, I'm only a young researcher. My struggle is that age or ageism within academia will limit opportunity for a research career. And despite my capabilities, there will be, both personally and professionally, thinking that it is luck or good fortune, that someone of my age finds employment in research. This is another aspect of imposter syndrome and that we, th we should discuss quite clearly. Inga said, yes, I suspect aid is not much of a factor, as not so much of a factor as we might think. Perhaps it's the rapid change in context and life circumstances that provokes it. It's the heart and I, it's a heart and identity issue. Do I really feel I can inhibit this researcher's persona? <laughs> so now back to Inga. <laughs> Anna, yay, Anna, thank you. 
We're going to take her out later and we're going to give her a few drinks. Yeah. Because she looks like she needs it now. <laughs> <laughs> but she did really well. Thanks so much. Okay, just to, to a few last posts that we wanted to highlight before we take some questions from Twitter and from Periscope. Um, an anonymous student commented, I think the discussion is too limited if we only talk about the supervisor. Maybe this is coming to a future model, but to me there should be more than one pair of hands to assist PhD students. There should be circles of support. It's like anything else in life. You don't just have one person who performs all the roles. You have lots of different people, partner, friends, colleagues, acquaintances, nemesis. I like the nemesis. And the anonymous proposed that there were three, three circles of support. The supervisory panel, the administrative and the university support, and then the personal circle. I really like this idea and it's certainly one that scholars like myself have been pursuing in relation to PhD research. As you would have seen in the module on the medieval university, lots of us have become to question this sort of one-on-one um, -on -one intimate relationship and started to think about all the other things, um, animate and inanimate, and we'll get to that in the last module on love, believe it or not, that help us in, in our PhD journey. Um, and, but do universities really recognise and support these other circles? Do they think they're doing good work? This was an interesting question brought up by Bron Lee, which earned her badge. And she connected the lack of recognition of this kind of, these extra layers of support with the medieval traditions. She included a rather amusing picture from Cambridge of a reenactment of some sort of um, uh, incident from the past between the, the gown and the town. Um, where the university proctors were enforcing some laws on the civilianry. And um, she wrote this comment with it. University proctors censored gambling and theatre at the fair, entertainment that was deemed sinful and distracting for students. Can you imagine this now? Quite delightful. Regulations for students at Cambridge today prohibit doing any paid work with the only exception that graduate students can do a maximum of 10 hours a week of their own supervision of undergraduates. Students are required to live within a certain number of miles from the town centre. And the idea is that you actually cut yourself off from that third layer of support, that you enter the ivory tower and um, you interact with the masters there only. And they, in the photo, she says, are sitting in judgment. Um, and she also sent us an interesting link. Did you know that Cambridge colleges spend three million years, um, three million years, no, they spend three million dollars a year on wine. Um, we've got a link that she sent with us and that we'll send through, but apparently, um, and I'm finding this quite, uh, uh, quite a good thing, that the spend is actually decreasing, um, which is good, I suppose. So, yeah, it is really interesting to think how we sort of set these, the university up to be a bubble, isolated from the rest of the world, um, but we still need that world and we need that world to help us through things like the imposter syndrome. So the last question we like, we'd like to pull out at the forums was from Dr Anker, who asked... How do I address the issue of a supervisor who is not interested in my topic of research? How do I address the issue of a non-cooperative supervisor who is always not satisfied with my research work and doesn't give an alternative solution? Interestingly enough, I had three emails just to my personal inbox this week on exactly the same subject. So I will write a longer blog post, which is usually what happens when I get repeated questions like that. It's a really difficult question to solve. Um, so my first response to it is that it's difficult to solve. If your topic doesn't lie in your supervisor's area of interest, there's probably not a lot you can do. Sometimes supervisors are given students because other supervisors have left. Sometimes they're given students because no one else in the department has the proximate expertise, all sorts of reasons. And I would always say to students in this situation that you find other people in your university or more likely probably other places, maybe online. Again, I say Twitter is a good way to meet people like that who have similar interests. Um, uh, join clubs on campus, join discussion groups and try to get your intellectual satisfaction and engagement um, elsewhere outside of the supervisory relationship. I'm very tempted to go into marriage metaphors and infidelity, but I'm not going to go there. Okay, my second response to it is to just recognise it's a relatively common issue. Um, now, often supervisors think it's sort of up to the student to find the answers and, and to really engage intellectually with the research without them. Um, and they feel that that's important to the development of the student as an independent scholar. And I think this is true to a certain extent, but I think if you feel your lack of progress is uh, being uh, a direct result of this lack of interest, 
then you need to keep looking and asking for it elsewhere. And again, I would recommend talking to people higher up, up in the faculty hierarchy within the department for advice, for expertise, for contacts. Um, so next week, um, I will talk about next week after we've taken some questions from Twitter. I know we've got a slight delay on Periscope. So I want to thank Anna again for her fantastic um, take up of the Periscope challenge. And I'll get one of our other moderators to, to take up the challenge next week. Uh, have we got any questions from Periscope? Yes. I know this, okay, go ahead, I've Katie. Got you. Yep. Um, so uh, just a second ago, Beverly Miles pointed out that evidence, archaeological evidence at Nalanda University in India shows teachers and students live together in the same house. I thought that was interesting. Oh, wow. So, okay, yeah, India's had an amazing scholarly history. I wish I had room to, to put all the stuff I discovered about India while we're searching the moon. Maybe um, next, if I expand it, or ever do it again. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, one of the questions is, um, what is the opposite of imposter syndrome? Mm. Is it arrogance and self-aggrandizement? Yes, well, I did write a post on academic arrogance and I have written on academic assholes, and I have written about this kind of phenomenon of thinking that people are more clever when they're rude and nasty. And, um, and also um, that, that need, that, that competitive pressure in academia to know everything, to be the best, I think does breed um, a certain, there is a certain kind of response to it that you probably could label as arrogance and often think that probably they may be as unconfident as the people who have imposter syndrome at heart. I, I don't know if you see this too, but the people who are truly knowledgeable, who are truly amazing, are the ones that ask lots of questions. Have you noticed that? I just put that out there. I think whenever I discover an academic who's willing to ask questions and entertain the idea that they're wrong, I know I'm in the presence of greatness um, because that's at heart the academic endeavour, I think, is to, to, to hold that doubt and to work with that doubt. Yeah. I don't know if that was a good answer, but another question, Katie? Yes, there's a few. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is... Um, Someone pointed out that PhD parents have twice as much imposter syndrome. Our <laughs> oh, PhD parents have a double load of imposter syndrome because they're imposter parents and imposter academics at the same time. Yeah, well, what can I say to that? Um, when I had my baby, I think I was holding him in six weeks old and another more experienced mother said to me, look, the only advice I'm going to give you is you have to learn to trust yourself. And I hung on to that like a life raft through through parenting, and I think I hung on to it through my PhD as well. At a certain point, you have to learn to trust yourself. And that's at the notion, that's at the heart of being an independent scholar, I think. Um, so someone uh, just commented about the academic assholes. Oh, yes. Um, are they just suffering from imposter syndrome secretly themselves? I do wonder that. Well, I, think, I think it's such a complex phenomenon, and um, I'm keen to write some more about academic assholes. Um, Robert Sutton is the book, wrote the book, and he has a theory in the book called The Total Cost of Assholes, and um, in which he talks about all the people that leave or don't progress because they, you know, don't deal well with, with that culture. And I think it's an important point. Um, so another question we got was, what is your top tip for dealing with imposter syndrome when it's holding you back, when it is prohibitive of getting anything actually done? So my very, very favourite top tip for getting rid of imposter syndrome um, comes um, actually from Virginia Valen, who wrote an amazing article called Learning to Work. And this, in this article, she talks about um, how the way that you get past this kind of thinking pattern is to set a small amount of time for writing, she says 15 minutes, and that you must write just for the pleasure of it without any expectation of a return. Um, interestingly enough, and stay with me here, she wrote this in the sort of well, late 70s, early 80s, and she was very influenced by the sex therapy at the time, which talked about pleasure over fulfilment. <laughs> and, um, and she applied this very interestingly to the, to the, the problem of work. And it's a fantastic essay. Um, and I would have put it in my notes if I thought of it, but we will tweet it out afterwards. It's called Learning to Work. It's on my website. I've put it there very early on as one of my favourite inspirational pieces. And I think the reason that it works is you're taking the expectation off yourself and you're also taking away the thought of the audience because at heart, I think, the imposter syndrome is that fear of being found out. It's that performance anxiety, essentially, 
of thinking of other people judging you. So suspending that is really important in order to get things done, but you can't suspend it for very long periods of time. You can only suspend it for short periods before it all rushes in again. So 15 minutes on a timer and just try and enjoy it. Um, very best advice I've ever got. Um, someone pointed out, I started writing a blog for pleasure writing and interesting stuff from mm. my work has resulted. So yeah. the pressure off. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say, I just enjoy, I love writing my blog. I love it. It's from Periscope. And writing, writing uh, journal articles, I don't love that. And, and that's because, and it's funny because far more thousands and thousands of people read the blog, hundreds of people maybe read the article, and yet I don't worry about the blog and I worry heaps about the article. So yeah, I think it's really, it's in our heads. Um, but it's easy to tell someone to just forget it. It's much harder to do it. Have time for a few more? I have time for more? Yeah. Um, Margaret Brisbane wants to know, how do you know if you really have imposter syndrome or are really an imposter? <laughs> oh, okay. So it's like, I've pointed out that you've got a thing called imposter syndrome and go, right, okay, and go, yeah, I get that, but I'm actually an imposter. So you got into a PhD. I'm just going to leave it at that. It's hard to get in. We make it really difficult. You have to write stuff. You have to talk to people. You have to have great grades. You, if you make it through that process, you are not an imposter. That's all I've got to say. We can verify that. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone on, uh, on Periscope asked, how do you remember all these books? Oh, <laughs> how do I remember all these books? I know, I'm just so, you know. <laughs> what can I say? Well, it's been my area of research for 10 years. I'm an, this is what it means to be an expert. It's, it's all kind of sitting in there. I also have a big, big um, bookshelf over there full of them. So I see them every day. They're my friends, my books and my friends. It's sad, but it's true. I have lots of other actual human friends too. <laughs> There'll be no living with you after this. No, I know. <laughs> they, they really have to push me through the door on the way out after these Periscope broadcasts. It's all the love hearts. My head gets so big. Um, and another question was, let me just find it. Is it normal to feel your work isn't PhD standard, not complex enough to pass? It's so completely normal to feel that your work isn't PhD standard. In fact, one of the most um, common things that I encounter talking to students who are weeks away from completing is they're going, oh, it's, I think it's just a master's. Really? I, I, don't, I don't think it's a PhD. Um, and it's that curse of knowledge, and we'll get into this much more next week. It's the curse of knowledge. The more that you know about it, the more obvious and simple it becomes. So, in fact, the more that you think it's simple, the more likely it is to be a PhD. If it's 400 pages long and you're not repeating the same word every time, then I think it's a PhD. It just seems really simple to you because you've immersed yourself in it that long. And that's, that's the little pet talk that I often give at thesis boot camp. In fact, I spend hours sitting with people saying, no, actually, you really do have a PhD, trust me. Um, and it, it constantly amazes me. But I felt that too myself by the end. Um, and just take it as a good sign that you've, you've, you're an expert. You've mastered the topic insofar as one ever can, of course. Um, yeah, great. Any other questions there? Um, no, but someone asked, can we see the rest of your office? Yes, you can <laughs> see the rest of my office. Why don't we very slowly start with my new bookshelf? You can see one of my favourite things here is my bunny rabbit given to me by my son. It's um, felt grass, fake grass. Um, I have here... A collection. I'm so glad someone asked me this. I have here a collection you can see on my shelf. I collect um, collateral from other universities, so cups and ornaments that have other universities logos on them. I love those. And over here we have, get ready, the table of doom. Now, no, and you need to stand up because that is a Fred Ward chair. We're very proud of these at ANU. They're originally made for the university from Australian native hardwood, and each of those chairs is worth about $1,000 each. I have about $9,000 worth of, of furniture in my... Yes, we won't get into that. And in the corner, the very, very famous yet very quiet Mr Thesis Whisperer. That's Luke. And there's all my book collections. And then around here we can see, if we move slowly, oops, Katie. Oh, 
Hello. <laughs> and that's my mood board there, you can see. I use social media and I vote, which is my favourite bumper sticker. And any cards that people give me. And my Apple, Apple stuff. And my little minion. My minion. Your nephew my... just said, hi, uncle. Oh, <laughs> my nephew thinks okay, I'm an uncle still. Hi, Ollie. Thanks, Minimum Chips and Cat. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for that question. And thanks for tuning in. Next week, we're going to be talking about... Where? What are we talking about? Where did I put oh, one wow, That's a great question. Oh, my goodness. Frustration. <laughs> Frustration. <laughs> Frustration. Frustration. And we're really going to delve into feedback. Why is it that some supervisors are great writers, but they can't give feedback? What's all that about? We'll talk about it next week. Look forward to joining you on the discussion boards then. Hope I see some of you at the ANU 3 Minute Thesis Final. I'll be sending out a link to the live stream. And good night. Thanks, everyone. See you really soon.